Coming up on Tech News Today, Nokia takes a shot at iOS Maps, HP accuses autonomy of fraud, and ESPN goes live on the Xbox. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, 20th November, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by ShareFile. Enhance your workflow, send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile by Citrix. Try ShareFile today. For a 30-day free trial, go to sharefile.com, click the radio microphone, and enter TNT. And by MailRoute, email filtering in the cloud for companies and resellers of any size. MailRoute offers live support and one-click sign-up. For free Postini migration and 10% off the life of your account, visit MailRoute.net, click the sign-up button, and enter the promo code TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Maya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. This is the show where we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting each time with the top 10 stories of the day. We call it Minecraft. Or in your case. Reuters reports HTC CEO Peter Chow told reporters the company is happy with its patent settlement with Apple. Chow also called estimates that HTC will pay Apple 6 to $8 per phone baseless and very, very wrong. That's two varies. The CEO would not comment on a specific number that they will be paying Apple. Look, it's here. No, it's really here. This is Nokia's Maps app for iOS called here. It's available now. Reviews on the App Star Store are far from good, with the app garnering two and a half stars out of five. The Verge found some of the directions nonsensical. But hey, it's free, right? HP reported mixed earnings, beating expectations and earnings per share, but missing its sales expectations. The company also announced it will take an impairment charge of $8.8 billion, $5 billion of which will be for what it calls accounting improprieties, misrepresentations, and disclosure failures used by the company Autonomy to inflate its value. HP acquired Autonomy while Leo Apotheker was still CEO. Apotheker told the Wall Street Journal he was, quote, both stunned and disappointed to learn of Autonomy's alleged accounting improprieties. Former Autonomy CEO Mike Lynch has flatly rejected the allegations, according to Reuters. Email privacy? You know what? You don't need that. A new Senate bill would allow a whole bunch of regulatory agencies uh, access to your emails without a warrant. The agencies would need a subpoena. Oh, yeah. Emergency situations would have different rules, which would allow an agency to access emails without a warrant or later court review. If your email was accessed, you'd get a notification within 10 business days. Oh, but that can be postponed by up to 360 days. The bill is up for a vote next week. But, you know, the mining regulatory agency really does need to read your email Absolutely. without a warrant. I mean, it's, it's important. Christopher Poole, a.k.a. Moot, the founder of 4chan, has sent a letter to a startup at the website moot.it asking it to change its name. Poole's lawyer claims a protectable right of publicity to use the name Moot in online discussions. Poole has gone by the nickname Moot since 2003. Moot IT has not yet launched, but says it will include forums and comments as when it does. Someone has resolved it to be a Moot point. The user at NYT... Cease and desist. <laughs> the user at NYT on it regularly mocks New York Times headlines, but the account was suspended on Twitter. The reason, the Times says that the Twitter account violates the New York Times trademark. Now, the account avatar uses the New York Times T logo, which looks like a hat on top of it. The account is now back up, but with a generic egg avatar for now. The photo and video sharing site and app Color officially announced it will shut down as of December 31st. According to legal paperwork obtained by TechCrunch, Adam Witherspoon is filing a lawsuit against Color and co-founder Bill Wayne alleging misdeeds and intentional infliction of emotional distress. Color has not responded to the allegations. Google's working on an open alternative to AirPlay, says Google product manager Timbo Drayson. That's a great name. Speaking to GigaOM. Timbo says that the goal is to move the whole industry forward. Uh, most curious about the new protocol would be two-way communication between devices. So maybe in the future, Google TV would beam content to your Android device. 
Google's lobbying efforts seem to be paying off. In a letter to Federal Trade Commission Chairman John Lebowitz, Representatives Anna Ishu and Zoe Lofgren of California said they believe agency action against Google would be, quote, unwarranted, unwise, and likely have negative implications on our nation's economy, end quote. The FTC has been investigating antitrust allegations against Google. Deadline Hollywood says TVGuide.com is on the verge of being sold off for about $20 million. All Things D says the buyer could be Yahoo. The deal is not yet finalized as Yahoo is looking to see if TV Guide would make sense in its overall strategy. Smart move. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Citrix and ShareFile. Everyone in business has had to deal with emailing a file that was too big. And you're like, how do I get this file? I, do, I, do I put it up on some fly-by-night site that doesn't have encryption and I'm not sure it's safe? No, I'm not going to do that. You need a confidential way and a secure way to send files. And... You need access to documents on the go. A lot of times you're stuck in an airport or a hotel room, and you, you, you may not have that file on your hard drive. Wouldn't it be nice if not only could you email those big files, but send them securely and be able to access them wherever you are? The answer to these problems is ShareFile by Citrix, the all-in-one business solution for sending, sharing, and receiving files of almost any size. ShareFile was designed for businesses and is customized to meet your company's specific needs. Every file stays under your control, so you know it's secure. You can manage who has access. You can even manage how long they have access to it. You can set an end date saying, look, if they don't access it by this date, I just want it to sunset. You can see when they open the files, too. I've used this before to be like, hey, did you get that file? Yeah. Yeah, you haven't looked at it because I can tell you haven't opened the file. Plus, ShareFile allows you to access files from any computer or mobile device, helping you work more efficiently. And I and it's been doing that for us. I know it'll do the same for your business. Try ShareFile today. Sign up with our special offer, a full 30-day free trial. So you don't have to take our word for it. Go try it out. Go to ShareFile.com, click on the radio microphone, and enter TNT. Remember, visit ShareFile.com and type in TNT. We thank Citrix and ShareFile for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us now, uh, of course, Sarah Lane out on uh, vacation, but we're happy to have, happy, we're, we happen to have, but we're also happy to have, David Pierce, Reviews Editor at The Verge. How's it going, David? Doing well. Thanks for having me back. Thanks uh, for coming back. Uh, always, always enjoy having you on. Uh, let's start today with that Nokia Here app. I, as you were you were giving it a try this morning, and it it didn't give you exactly the results that maybe you expected. Now, in all fairness, I just tried it out this morning, so I'm not an expert yet. Maybe there are features I'm not sure of yet. But uh, I, I took a look at it because I saw the news. App Store reviews are out there, two and a half stars. 62 out of the 157 give one star. 47 or five star. The ratings go from absolute garbage. That's a quote to <laughs> others saying it's the best maps for iOS. All right. So the Best way to go, I think, is to actually try it out. We're going to show you, if you're, on, if you're watching the video, I'm going to actually show you it running live. Now, it looks like you can get, uh, this is the map area right now. I'm actually looking at, at driving directions from my place to Twit. Now, if you want, you can switch it to walking directions or public transit. The walking directions are a little strange. This is this, I don't know if you can see how... It seems to be like, go into this block, turn oh, left, turn right. It's making you take a little jagged stair step. And, Is there some pedestrian walkway there uh, that makes you know, it easier? From what I know, walking this distance, you don't need to necessarily mm. do that. So I'm not sure why uh, Nokia thinks that's the better Maybe way. Maybe it knows it's raining and you're more likely to get splashed if you walk down the straight If way. it's that smart, I'd love it. <laughs> uh, the The text is a bit fuzzy on the, uh, on the iPad. It looks like it's not retina optimized. There's only audio directions for when you're walking and not when you're driving. So you're not getting cues when you're driving. So that's not so helpful. And, uh, you know, it, it's definitely a first uh, rev on this because you do have a lot of Nokia style on this. So I'm thinking a lot of people don't like it because they see iOS and they're like, what is this? So you're seeing an extra menu. You can change your views. You can get traffic information. It's pretty robust for a first try. Uh, but it's definitely, uh, I think people are saying this is not the replacement for Google Maps by any means. How is it compared to Waze or, or some of those other alternatives? I, I mean, obviously, everybody wants an alternative to Apple Maps if they're using iOS. Well, I got to say, it's probably not as good. There's no turn-by-turn -turn directions. So when I'm driving around, I can't actually, I have to keep looking down, which would mean death. So I'd prefer to not use that especially with a new application like this, because there are alternatives out there that you're, have... You're not implying that this is a dangerous app. No, no, okay. no. I'm just saying that it, it would be beneficial for Nokia to have turn-by-turn. -turn. David, what, what do you think about the fact that this app is out now and it's not uh, what people need it to be yet? Yeah, so I got I got really excited when they said it was coming out and when it came out this morning, uh, because, you know, like everyone else, 
I think Apple Maps is just the worst thing in the world. Um, but it and Nokia's mapping stuff for Windows Phone and for some of the other Nokia phones out there is really good. Uh, but it's just not what I wanted it to be. It has, you know, transit directions is one of the big things for me because I live in New York. Uh, and it's just not a great transit system. It has transit directions, but it's wrong sometimes. And it doesn't do as well with like scheduling and all this stuff. Google is great for that and still is. Uh, and I agree with you. I think it's it's a first rev and they've, they've done a lot of things. And this seems more like a feature list. Like here's all the things that will work you know, three, six months from now, as opposed to here's what we have right now. And I think it's it's a decent start and they could pass Apple pretty fast. You know, the one thing that I use these maps for all the time is, is finding businesses. Let's, let's, I'm headed to a, uh, a particular neighborhood or even I'm just investigating, you know, I'm going to be moving at, after the first of the year and I want to know like, okay, what what kind of stuff is available in that neighborhood? What's around there? Where where are the In-N-Out burger joints? Uh, and I don't see that on here at, at all. Is, is it an option that I'm they are, missing? They are available. I'm, I, I couldn't tell you directly how to access them because you just okay, keep well, pressing that's buttons. Just, that's silly. You have to hit, like, the, I believe the back button, and then uh, on the bottom, something will show up. As, what back button are you talking on about? On the top left, there's a here logo. And now I'm oh, also, I'm in the I see now. Here's the thing. I'm in the iPhone version, uh, not the iPad version. I don't see any back button. There are distinct versions, by the way. There's, yeah. the, I, there's the iPad version. It's not a blown-up version. And there's the iOS version for uh, iPhone. But it does show you, I can't get it right now apparently, it does show you nearby places to eat, places to go out, if you can get it to But work. you know how on Google Maps it just has those those all names the pop interest. up, the points of interest, exactly, right. and I don't, I don't see anything like that. Well, unless they all went away, I don't see them on this map right now. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the... Uh, the pubs are still around, but I don't see it. I, I would not agree with absolute garbage, but I also wouldn't agree with uh, the best maps for iOS. When I first downloaded it and opened it up, I thought this this looks like a decent maps app. It's pretty responsive. It's easy for me. It's very familiar, uh, so I, I get how to use it right away. But it just seems to be lacking some of the features I would want. It's free, so <laughs> there you go. Yeah, you're not paying a dime. There we go. For I found it. it. I finally clicked a location, and then I can find nearby places. Like shopping and going out and yeah, but I want to see them on the map. Oh well, that's that just silly, Tom. Like that. Yeah, not yet. All the right, points you know, of interesting could yeah. be really cool, uh, and that's the thing. You know, I've talked to a lot of people uh, about Apple Maps since it's come out, and that's the thing that people really dislike. You know, people like turn by turn directions, and people like even the look of it. You know, the weird Hoover Dam being a roller coaster thing was was bad, but there are just no places on it. You search for a restaurant or a bar, and it's not there. Uh, and, I, and Nokia could have fixed that and been yeah. huge and popular from like moment one and they just didn't. Yep. Let's talk a little bit about HP and their uh, their costs and accusations. Uh, let's we'll talk less about the earnings report, which 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 was mixed. It's actually not a bad earnings report for HP, all things considered. Uh, but five billion dollars to clean up autonomy. They paid twelve billion dollars uh, and and in cash and debt under Leo Apotheker and CSO Bill Vate back uh, when they were still with the company. Uh, they uh, also did an $8 billion charge associated with a write-down on Goodwill on EDS. So there's, there's $12, $13 billion that they have been writing down because of bad acquisitions done during the Apotheker error. Uh, error. Uh, that was just a Freudian slip, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> HP said the charge had to do with, quote, serious accounting improprieties, disclosure failures, outright misrepresentations at autonomy. And Meg Whitman on the earnings call went into a little more detail, as did CFO Kathy Lesjak. Uh, they claimed that autonomy sold hardware at a loss, but booked the hardware as high margin sales, booking a portion of the cost as marketing. Uh, thus, it looked like hardware was selling better than it was. Uh, that Autonomy sold software to value-add resellers with no end users inflating revenue. Uh, Long-term hosting deals were converted to short-term licensing deals, boosting subscription revenue numbers that would normally be deferred and not booked. So it made it look like they had a really robust subscription service that, that maybe they didn't have. HP CFO Kathy Leschak said Autonomy was able to boost its gross margins, uh, which is a key measurement of profitability. Uh, and where Autonomy had been reporting gross margins in the neighborhood of 40 to 45 percent, Leschak said, realistically, it looks like it's more 28 to 30 percent. And that may not sound like a lot to you, but when you're paying for a company, uh, you pay based on what you think you're going to be able to make off them going forward. And that that is exactly how they uh, how they valued the company. On the other hand, you've got Apotheker saying, 
yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked by this. I have no idea why this would happen. And maybe that's just what you would expect him to say if he's denying any culpability. However, you also have the CEO, the former CEO of Autonomy, who has left HP now, saying that flat, I flatly reject this. This, this is not true. Who should we believe? How and how do we tell? Well, I mean, the as you put it, I guess accidentally, the apothecary error. I mean, that that's possibly what happened here. That he was so maybe enamored with this change of HP from from being what it was as a consumer facing company to this IBM style. We're going to pivot completely. They maybe maybe there was just some kind of not looking at detail when it came to autonomy, not seeing that this was happening. Uh, when it comes to uh, apothecary, basically, you know covering himself by saying, oh, look, that's that's something I didn't even notice. The, cu the curiosity is, well, did he notice this? And this is one of the reasons why he's gone already, because he was he was there for like a blink of an eye and gone because he wanted to do so many different things with HP that just didn't seem the right way. Uh, as for the former, uh, the former head of autonomy, I mean, I don't know what he has to gain or lose by saying anything at this point. Well, that's what surprised me that he actually spoke up at all. I would expect him to just not comment on it one way or the other whether he's innocent or not but he's being aggressive and going on cnbc i think uh saying no this isn't what happened he definitely told reuters about this david what's your interpretation of all of this i don't know it's it's really odd my first reaction was kind of kudos to hp for you know being honest and forthcoming and talking about what actually happened and how it worked and the mistakes they may have made uh and now it looks like you know, that Meg Whitman might be trying to blame Leo Apotheker and he might be trying to blame somebody else. It's it's very strange. And it's it's an enormous amount of money, especially relative to how much they paid for autonomy in the first place. Uh, and it's something that I think could become kind of significant one way or the other. And it's it's somebody's going to end up looking really, really bad coming out of this, especially as they've all taken such strong stances against it. It's certainly a good narrative to say, yes, we've been losing a lot of money. We've had to do a lot of write downs. We've made a lot of mistakes with acquisitions, but those all happened in a previous regime. Uh, there, there was a statement at one point saying, well, the board members approved this and they and, and we, we bear some responsibility. And Meg Whitman was on that board. Uh, but we were going based on the information that was given us. Uh, by the investigation. Now, this investigation wasn't just done internally at HP. They they hired outside firms and respectable outside firms to look at this. So it's it's cur it's curious to me how all of this was missed uh, somehow. Uh, but on on the other hand, I, I don't think it likely that Whitman and HP would just cook the books now uh, to make make things look worse uh, than they already are. That that wouldn't help HP now at all. Right. Examining all the years of of, of uh Autonomy's books could take a long time as well. Maybe they bought it hastily when it came to that purchase. But the other thing is, it would be it'd be insane for HP to. If this isn't true. If HP like did some really creative accounting to create this thing, they're gonna have they're gonna face such a huge backlash and problem with lo the law. So that's why I'm more likely to believe HP on this one when it comes to where did this charge come from? Why does it seem to be Autonomy's uh, division that was a problem? Because HP is the surviving company, so they can easily say that company over there screwed up things. We're going to fix it in the long term. All right. Uh, Patrick Leahy, chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, introduced the Electronic Communications Privacy Act in May 2011. Uh, it's meant to fix the problems with the 1986 Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which was built during the telecommunications era, when uh, the Internet wasn't what it is in any sense of the word. Uh, it was meant when it was first introduced to protect your privacy, to say, look, you should they should you should have the protection of a warrant if someone wants to go look at your digital files the same way you would have to have a warrant if someone wants to go look at your files in your filing cabinet it all made perfect sense but a lot of law enforcement agencies objected saying look this is more like cell phone stuff we need to be able to get on these things quickly if we're going to catch the bad guys and you're going to you're going to really hamper legitimate investigations into criminals if you pass this act so a new rewrite has been exposed by Declan McCullough at CNET, which allows 22 agencies, some of which, are, you know, FBI, et cetera, some of which are OSHA, the FTC, a, a mining regulatory agency. These 22 agencies would be able to access email, Google Docs files, Facebook wall posts, Twitter direct messages without a search warrant. Uh, the, the rewrite is scheduled for a vote Next week, uh, law enforcement agencies object object to the requirement of a warrant, and it looks like Leahy has has sort of caved. Now, there's still some privacy protections in here, uh, but not nearly as many as there were before. 
the the result may be that they want to take this to court. U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that the police do need a search warrant for GPS tracking of vehicles. Lower courts have ruled the same for cell phones and email. Uh, but a lot of people are saying, wait a minute, should we should we mount an internet protest? Should we try try to protect our privacy? You know, we did this to stop Pippa and Sopa. This seems to be even more important. David, do you do you think that that is true? That the, this is a threat to internet freedom? Yeah, I think this is this is incredibly important, uh, and where it lands is is ultimately going to be really significant. I mean, given the the precedent with cell phones and uh, the use of email, all of which have been kind of struck down, being able to search them without a warrant, um, my I, I don't necessarily assume that this is going to really become anything. Just like you know, a lot of these other bills that we've seen, they tend to be terrifying and really go nowhere. Um, but if this does pass, I mean, it's it's a really scary idea as someone who, you know, everything I do, everything I use, all of my files, all of my personal data, it's all online somewhere. And the idea that between, you know, Twitter and Facebook and Google Docs and my email, that they, without a warrant, they can come in and just take whatever they want is, is a scary idea. And like, I'm a boring person, like nobody's going to find anything in my files. But uh, as, as we move online, and as people continue to keep things online, uh, this idea gets scarier and scarier. And I think, you know, people already already have this worry about putting stuff online for privacy fears. And as much as I think that's a little overdone, this could make it, you know, a legitimate fear. One thing to keep in mind is all of those fears you have are, are applicable right now because under the 1986 Act, it doesn't apply to the Internet. So when you store a file in Google Docs, you actually have less protection right now than you have if you store it on a local hard drive and keep it in a filing cabinet. Right. Uh, and, and, and what this act was meant to do is fix that. And so it's still fixing it. It's just fixing it for many fewer instances than it did in the original write-up. And the original write-up seemed to be, okay, these agencies didn't have these kind of access. This is, uh, I guess, a little tighter. Then this rewrite's incredibly broad, so that's probably going to get thrown out again, and they have to do some kind of middle ground. It's kind of strange for uh, Patrick Leahy to do this because he's very, very privacy-centric at times. At, at times. times. That's why it's not surprising. That's why, well, <laughs> to me, I just think it's, yeah. it's, it's strange because his original proposal was not this full of holes. Now it's like, okay, by the way, we're going to let everybody into this giant back door. It's like it having, seems that he has a history of that, though. He's done other acts, like the Kalea Act mm -hmm. in the 90s, where he's like, I'm going to protect people. Oh, people complain, so now I'm going to back. It's like having a big giant gate in the front of your house and a big open screen door in the back. That's basically what he's done with this this bill. I'm expecting it's, the vote's up next week, so hopefully it'll get it'll get thrown out and tried over again. But it's it's definitely something to, t to pay attention to. Yeah, and it, 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 this is the kind of thing that changes the calculus on cloud security for me. If, if people are saying, oh, don't store your stuff in the cloud, it's not, it's not under your control, you could lose it. What if the company goes out of business? Those risks seem similar to having to manage the hard drives yourself. I feel like, you know, just data flaw-wise, your, your, your stuff is probably safer in the cloud because you've got professionals with multiple redundancies manning it versus your own backup solutions that you would have to do at home, right? But... If the law says, oh, but yeah, if you store it in the cloud, then anybody can just go see it with a subpoena. They don't need a warrant. Then I'm going to want to store all of my stuff locally because it's got more protection legally. And then the argument is, it just like, is the internet just a really long cable to your hard drive or not? Yeah. It should be. It should but be. But it's not. But so well, yeah, exactly. We need to figure that out. And, maybe this, and then maybe this ends up going to the courts if it ends up uh, getting passed. Let's take a quick break and uh, thank our other sponsor for today's show, Mail Route. You don't want spam. Uh, but you do want access to your email, and MailRoute is the solution to that. They bring you maximum no spam. Justin Robert Young coined that phrase, and MailRoute said, yep, that's exactly what we do. We make sure that the email that is good, that you want to read, goes through, and all the rest of that stuff, the other 90% of the stuff gets blocked. I've, I've resurrected an email address with MailRoute myself. So go give it a try. If you're if you're uh, in the enterprise and you're on Postini and you're saying, oh, MailRoute sounds great, but I've got this Postini contract I'm stuck with, MailRoute will match your current Postini pricing. Uh, it's a no-brainer. Switch from Ma Postini to MailRoute for free. And, and customer support available 24-7. Uh, they'll give you a call back at the latest within the hour, uh, whenever you, you file a ticket. So so go give them a try. Uh, over the last 12 months, they blocked 235,000 spam messages for my account. Try it free. Visit MailRoute.net, click the sign-up button, enter the promo code TNT, start a 15-day free trial, and if you decide to keep it, get 10% off the life of your account. No credit card required for that free trial either. MailRoute.net, 
click the sign up button, enter the promo code TNT, and we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. ESPN full programming as it's broadcast coming to the Xbox. Yeah, this is this is crazy. So watch ESPN app has been updated for the Xbox 360. It used to be that you had a very limited selection of what you could get. I think you got like ESPN 3 and t recorded things. But now you get live content from ESPN, ESPN 2, ESPN U, ESPN 3, and more. So this is the top tier ESPN stuff you're going to get on your Xbox 360. Obviously, it still requires you to have a video subscription with an affiliated uh, company like Comcast or Time Warner or Verizon. So there's still you still have to have that tether. You can't just cut the cord yet. And there's a video demo at GeekWire showing off the power of the app. I mean, you can watch two things at once. There's a live ticker on the bottom. You can tell it what your favorite teams are. You can find out all this data pretty quickly from the Xbox interface. Uh, it also has a DVR-like functionality, although GeekWire couldn't get it to work. Uh, they also found there was like a 10-second delay compared to live TV. David, I know you're an avid sports fan. Is this kind of presentation of ESPN, is this the, the kind of thing that would pick, make you pick watching on your Xbox over your cable box? I think so. I really do. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, ESPN's been kind of at the front of all this stuff bringing live sports to other things than your cable box and your TV. Uh, and having, you know, having the ticker and having extra statistics and being able to watch two things at a time and flip around in this way like this it's it's a great thing and espn has this giant world of content and they're doing a really good job of actually getting it out there i wish they'd you know offer it without a cable subscription but i think that's just a pipe dream probably forever because of just the way espn does its business um but as they you know at least your cable subscription now buys you access on lots of different platforms and ESPN, you know, they've been making deals for, uh, that have included streaming since, you know, years and years ago before it was even a really kind of feasible thing for them to do. And I think it's, it's, it's really great and it's really exciting. And I hope more people jump on board. It's, this is a great way to watch sports. It's funny that you say that uh, this will never <laughs> this will never be available on its own without a cable subscription. Michael Powell, former FCC commissioner and FCC chairman, uh, who's now the head of the NCTA, which is the cable television lobbying group, came out today and said, it's the content companies. They're the problem. We'd love to give you a la carte cable. We'd love to give you direct subscriptions uh, over the Internet. It's those evil cable c channels that won't let us. Uh, and that's, uh, I think he's over-protesting because he's the head of that agency but i think he's he's right i mean an espn is is not going to want to give up the money that they get from from the cable subscriptions because they get a lot of money that way now i was i was watching this video demo and i'm like well you know what i actually i might then get cable to have the lowest tier version of it that gives you the horrible sd version just so i can hook up an xbox to watch this stuff because this is the presentation i've wanted to see for the longest time if they can add more things like i don't know taking out the color commentators or taking out play-by-play let me just watch the video. The real interactive television feel of this, this is what I've wanted television to be since I saw Media Center and Web TV a long time ago. So I'm, I'm excited about that. It's never going to be a cord-cutting solution because you still have to have that attachment. But if you're going to have another box, why not have a ton of other features that makes it a, a totally unique experience? Well, what Microsoft's trying to do is become a box-ditching solution so that you're not cutting the cord, but the Xbox becomes your cable box. Uh, and 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 the, they're not quite there yet. You still can't plug the uh, the cable into your Xbox yet. But this this gets you a little closer. Uh, and it's and it's certainly if you put the Xbox in a different room from your cable box, all of a sudden you can watch ESPN in two rooms. Yeah, I'm just I I want this. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Google wanting to take on Apple. We mentioned that AirPlay initiative, AirPlay-like initiative in the right. news views. Every, yeah, when I say AirPlay-like, I know people are having conniptions because there's things out there like DLNA has been around for a long time. There's Miracast. That's the newer standard where you can stream video back and forth. Actually, one way. Uh, so uh, there was an interview with uh, GigaOM, and like I said, the product manager with the greatest name on, on earth, Timbo Drayson, saying that, quote, we really want to m move the whole industry forward and buried in the story is the fact that this is a new protocol that lets the data go both ways. Like I said before, that would mean the developers could build second screen experiences that correspond to what's happening on live TV. So if you were watching like Game of Thrones, it could probably throw something back at you as opposed to launch the HBO Go app now. And then you kind of go that way. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of competing standards, like I mentioned. You know, DLNA, Miracast, there's Apple's AirPlay. 
Uh, Tom, do you think that Google's implementation, is this the kind of thing that they could make work, or is this just one other standard? Well, cer certainly they can make it work. Apple's made it work. It's technically possible, right? Uh, the, the question is, will, will they make it work in a way that helps the consumers more than it helps Google or manufacturers, or will they be able to pull off both? That, that, that's the challenge, right? What Apple does is say, hey, if you live in the Apple universe, great. You can AirPlay anything anywhere now. Your iPad, your iPhone, your MacBook, doesn't matter. As long as you got the newest equipment uh, or, or even recent equipment with the latest operating system, AirPlay away. Use it all the time. It's fantastic. If Google comes out with a way to say, it doesn't matter what ecosystem you're, you're working in, uh, we, can, we can send an AirPlay. That would be fantastic. I don't expect them to be able to send your IBM or your IBM ThinkPad. How old am I? Uh, to send your ThinkPad video to a Roku using a Google system. So I'm guessing what they do is say, you're going to have to have a Google TV, either an, an LG with Google TV built in, that kind of system, or a box of some kind that has Google TV. But then if they can say, then you just, you just need to have any kind of device uh, and running our software, that would be brilliant. David, what do you think about the two-way communication aspect? Because I know that there's, you know, there's all these companion apps, and there's Smart Glass, and there's the the Wii U kind of has that second screen experience. If it's controllable from the box, does that make a difference? Um, honestly, I don't, I don't, I don't know totally how you get a system that's a lot better than something like Smart Glass or the Wii U, where everything is controlled, you know, because it's all happening kind of over the ad hoc Wi-Fi anyway. So if everything can, I can just be pulling everything onto the device I'm holding and want to touch. Uh, and there are even these cool apps that will like sync with the show that you're watching and you can kind of hear the audio and stuff's happening that way. So I'd, I'd be curious, like it's, I guess, better obviously to be able to talk both ways, but I'd be curious to see what Google can do that really adds something to the experience as opposed to just giving you yet another way to get information you already could have gotten from the devices you have. Uh, and Tom, I think that the thing you said about the Roku and the ThinkPad just makes me sad uh, because like, I, I want this to work so bad and it's never going to work until it works across platforms. We have, uh, you know, Miracast. Uh, every, a lot of people are excited about Miracast because it's an actual standard that a lot of people can use and it won't be, you know, it won't have Google's name attached to it. Uh, and DLNA is the same way, but the only people who have ever built decent DLNA implementations have built them for proprietary experiences like Samsung with the all share stuff. Uh, so what we need, and I feel like the only way this is ever going to really work in a really meaningful way outside of, you know, buying into the whole Apple ecosystem is if we get a real standard and I would love for that to come from Google, but I'm not at all convinced that it's going to come from Google. Well, and that's the thing, right? If this, if Google wanted a, an existing standard, they would, there are one of the standard that there's, they have some to choose from. They could jump in on one of these and, and they have in, in, in some limited ways. Uh, I don't know that saying, Oh, we're going to create a whole new protocol. I trust that that's going to be open for everybody to use And Why, why not make Miracast uh, popular and make it work and help improve it or DLNA either one. I mean, I can that's see a Google, really good point. I can see Google totally going up to the content partners and go, Hey, by the way, you know how you wanted that second screen? You're trying to do that with Zbox and all this other stuff. You're buying into it. We can control it from our end. I think they could probably work with their their YouTube partnerships to like leverage that into making this something that the content partners are like, yeah, sure, we're going to help you back it. And we'll even say on air, you know, use the Google whatever version this is. Because I think that's the kind of thing you need for DLNA or Miracast. You need education. And if it's not on television and not explained to anybody versus AirPlay, which is like, yeah, you just flick it over. It works easy. Yeah, if only their mission statement was don't be evil, <laughs> then maybe they would. I think that went with the... Well, with more. And what's weird is the Google even has, you know, the Nexus 4 supports Miracast. Like Google has right. thrown its hat into this ring in like a really limited way, but they've done it. And so I, unless there's some huge technological advancement that Google is coming out with, and I hope that's the case, uh, I honestly don't get why they wouldn't play along with the thing that helps the most people. You know, when you put it like that, it reminds me of WebM, where they're like, yeah. hey, we, we're going to buy a standard and make everybody use it. And no one does. It's just... I, I, and I hope that's not what happens here. Uh, let's finish off with some quantum mechanics. Don't be afraid. We're going to make it as easy to understand as possible. You better. Uh, quantum key distribution has had a big advance that allows it to be used over regular internet fiber. Here, just don't, don't get scared off by the word quantum. All quantum key distribution means is that your encryption is coded in light pulses. So instead, instead of just, you know, the, the, the packets 
going through and, and having a hashed algorithm, et cetera, et cetera, each photon has a certain polarization, and it can represent a zero or a one, and that polarization carries your encryption key, right? Well, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle states that when you observe a quantum system, it changes the state. You can't, it can't not. So if someone is hacking, uh, if someone is literally the man in the middle or the female in the middle uh, and looks at this photon, it will change the polarization and you'll be able to tell. You'll say, aha, this was, this was attempted to be observed and so we're going we're gonna to throw it out and start over again. And you would have to have exactly the right filter to not change the polarization, to know that, okay, this is the, the right photon. Now, previously, these photons were so faint. This quantum signal is so faint that it would have to be the only thing on your fiber. You could you, They call it dark fiber, but don't get confused with fiber that hasn't been turned on. It would have to be fiber. There's nothing else. There's no other signal there. Uh, and so it would require dedicated fiber. Andrew Shields, doc, Dr. Andrew Shields of Toshiba's Cambridge Research Laboratory and his colleagues have developed a way to send quantum key distribution signals over regular fiber. Here's what they did. You have a detector that is sensitive for a hundred millionths of a microsecond and a gate that opens for a tenth of a billionth of a second at just the time that the QKD photons arrive, the quantum key distribution photons arrive. So it's timed perfectly. Uh, and, and that sounds like, well, how are they going to pull that off? That, that part is actually easier than a lot of this other stuff. Uh, to open right when the photon comes and then close. So the rest of the light and the, the rest of the interference and the rest of the signal that's being sent uh, just, just goes where it's going to go. And you only get the photons that are part of the QKD. They've tested this standard fiber, regular data at one gigabit per second. They were running regular data one gigabit per second and a secure key rate of quantum of QKD uh, at 500 kilobits per second over, and uh, the other problem here is distance, right? Because light f sometimes fades over 50 kilometers of fiber. Uh, and they say, look, this is close to being out of the lab. When it comes out of the lab, it'll cost tens of thousands of pounds. But when you're talking corporate firewalls, that's competitive. That's that's in the realm of, of big companies and banks who, who need this kind of encryption. So you think, oh, this is, this is fantastic. We're going to have this super strong encryption. Then you get people like Bruce Schneier saying, great, we don't need super strong encryption. Uh, actually, you know, 256 AES works pretty well. That's the wrong problem to solve because it's not the encryption that people are cracking. It's spear phishing. It's phishing. It's getting, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's social engineering. It's, it's bad passwords. Uh, and, and he says, this is fine, but it's never going to go anywhere. So, practically speaking, this is about security. You are able to send more secure things uh, over distance. It's stronger security. stronger security. It's being able to use quantum uh, key distribution to encrypt, uh, which is stronger than the strongest regular encryption. So that, that we means have you now. could have a dumb password like one two three four five. And no, if it was that's what Schneier is saying is like, look, if your password's dumb, it's then somebody get... just needs to get access to your computer and they can decrypt all of this stuff. I think you wrote something like, if your security is putting a you know a stake in the ground. 50 feet or 100 feet tall, it doesn't matter. You can just go around if it. You can still go around the stake. So it, Making the stake taller doesn't help. In theory, this would be great for military and governments and, and people who actually are somewhat sort of paying attention to security versus the bank goer who does put 12345 as their password. So it's, it's an interesting idea. I'm just like, okay, wrapping my head around it. Like, who's going to use this? And when is this going to trickle down? And then does this, like, how does this actually change anything on, on a day-to-day -day basis? I somewhat disagree with Bruce's extreme view where he says this will be useless. Uh, we, we know there's a constant arms race and, and encryption needs to get stronger over time. So stronger encryption will, will eventually be necessary. But, but David, does the fact that this is quantum and, and almost unbreakable uh, because of the Heisenberg principle impress you? Or do you agree that it's like, well, that's the wrong problem to solve right now? I mean, so you you used a lot of words that I don't know, so that's <laughs> impressive. Um, but no, I mean, I, I tend to honestly side with uh, Iaz and, and Bruce a little bit, where it's like, uh, you know, with, with this uh, Matt whole Matt Honan story at Wired, where he found out that even having a strong password is kind of useless because there are all these other uh, really easy ways into your data and you know, phishing and social engineering. And even if you have a great password and great encryption and everything, all I have to do is, you know, call Apple and follow very four very simple steps and suddenly I'm into your stuff. So I think for for certain uses, like the there's this great extreme tech article talking about this stuff. And they talk a lot about the uh, the military applications. And that makes sense to me. 
you know, not having to bounce things off satellites. So data gets there faster uh, and it's more secure because there's it's uncrackable. So that's great. But uh, as far as, you know, the actual applicability to a regular human, uh, I don't I don't necessarily see it. And I, I, I kind of agree that we're not solving the biggest problem. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. And we just we just showed the Stanford article, uh, Stanford making advances in entanglement using quantum dot arrays, more more crazy words, but uh, making it, it, it possible to actually have another way of using encryption rather than the way that they're talking about at Toshiba. So another approaching the problem from the other end, but it's still it's still about encryption it's and 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 we still haven't solved the problem of passwords so i agree with you guys i don't think that this is bad research or it shouldn't be done it's exciting research but what it's going to solve for us is not the things we most need solved right now let's move on to the randomizer randomizer we do need to be able to move cursors with our brain uh, and a major milestone in the journey of brain-controlled computer cursors has taken place by a team at Stanford University creating the best, fastest, and most accurate algorithm for controlling computer cursors with thoughts. I, as and I were talking before the show, the impressive part about this article is not that they've created a better algorithm for controlling cursors with your thoughts, but that's a thing now where it's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> we've, we control cursors with our thoughts all the time, but we need a better way to do it. Well, yeah, I mean, I remember the studies about chimps being implanted with things that were able to move a cursor slightly. But the big thing about this change, apparently, is quickly stopping the cursor. Uh, previous algorithms, they could do one thing at a time, either the position or the velocity. So they couldn't stop it very quickly. But now that's changed. So that means you'll have more accurate movement of a cursor with your brain. Uh, that's just fun to say, isn't it? Yeah. We could, we could just start complaining, like, uh, you know, the cursor I control with my brain is not very responsive in this algorithm. I don't like it very much. First world problem. I mean, th this is fantastic research, David. You uh, you blown away by this as much as we are? Yeah, it's 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 completely insane. Um, and this this article, the the genius insight thing that you're showing, um, mentioned something about uh, creating robotic limbs that work even better. Yeah, and that's the part that really starts to blow my mind. Is that like it, suddenly it's it's different from you know we're we're actually improving the way that a prosthetic limb can work by improving you know it's 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 going to be awesome when i can just sit here and stare at my computer and it moves around and does stuff uh but when it's going to be really amazing is when we're actually a, like able to improve and create robotic limbs for people i 100 percent agree let's move on to the calendar Happy birthday, Windows. Microsoft announced the first version of Windows back on this day in 1985. I actually have the uh, somewhere over here, the uh, PC computing, personal computing magazine. He's looking for his personal computer magazine. Then Windows is now 27 years old. That's pretty yeah, darn old. That's crazy. Uh, tomorrow is also the Xbox 360's birthday. So it's, it's a Microsoft birthday week. The aging game console will be seven years old tomorrow. It's going mildly soon. Happy senile. birthday, Xbox. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. Message from Matt. Hi, guys. Thought you guys would be interested in a story currently breaking, well, since 7 p.m. Australia time. Australia's first attempt at a Black Friday style sale has failed in the worst possible way. I can tell you why, but go ahead. Core website failure one minute before sale starts, still down at 9 p.m. Other retailer sites down. Maybe worth looking into and seeing how bad some people do web infrastructure scalability down here. Quite embarrassing, really. Oh, Matt, don't be so high. Everybody has websites go down when a lot of people show up to them. The problem is you didn't have Thanksgiving first. So people didn't have all the turkey in their system slowing them down. Is now, it already Friday in Australia? Did that happen already? I don't think so. No, they're only a day ahead over there. They're not, okay, maybe they moved say. farther ahead. That's the other thing. You <laughs> need to drifted. have a Black Friday sale on Friday. <laughs> There's your problem. Here's your problem. Uh, Vladimir Garcia wrote in and said, Hey, I enjoy your web show all the way from Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. Thanks, man. Uh, I have something to share with you about something that you were talking about in one of the past shows, Google Smart Cars. There's a small experimental city near my housing complex called Mazdar City, right next to the airport, where everything in the city is either solar, wind, and thermal-powered, and the only mode of transportation is electric GPS-guided cars. The goal is to extend the transportation system to the whole area that he lives in by 2030. Uh, check it out at mazdarcity.ae for more details. These guys just live in the future. I'm I mean, retiring to Mazdar City. We got Australia's two days ahead. We got this happening. Yeah. It's wow, incredible. L last email from Ryan. He says, Hey, TNT crew, listening to your discussion on Apple's reported inclusion of Siri and Maps into the next version of OS X, 
If you like to miss something, along with the broader integration of iOS with OS X, is Apple simply preparing to offer LTE capability for their Air and Pro MacBook lines? Siri and Mapster systems which both depend on and increase the benefit of ubiquitous connectivity. I've been surprised that the MacBook Air hasn't already offered a mobile data option, but the trajectory of the OS makes me think that's eminent. What do you think? Do you think that... Uh, we're I, gonna have I personally, I think the two are entirely unrelated. I, I don't think he's wrong that Apple might come out with LTE built into a MacBook Air, but it has nothing to do with them putting these iOS things in there. They just want to unify the experience across the platform. David, do you think Apple's going to throw in some uh, connectivity wirelessly? In their uh, I'm, I'm kind of with Tom. I think... I hope they do. I think it'd be great if they did, but I don't think this has really anything to do with that at all. I think it's just, you know, people are like, oh, well, I have Siri on my phone. Why isn't it on my computer? And yeah. now they have an answer to that. Wishful thinking. All right, that's it for this episode of Tech News Today. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. Uh, David Pierce, thank you, man. Always great to have you on the show. I hope you come back uh, soon. My pleasure. And, and before I go, I just want to leave you with, uh, there's this great video of Steve Ballmer from 27 years ago selling... Uh, Windows 1. It's I think if you just Google Steve Ballmer sells Windows 1.0, it's incredible. You just have to watch it. I can't wait. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go dig that up uh, right away. Uh, TheVerge.com. Uh, anything else uh, people should know to to find yourself online? Uh, no, just The Verge. We've been doing all kinds of coverage of uh, the ecosystem universe and kind of the war for the living room, especially with like all this ESPN stuff going on. We've been covering a lot, so definitely yeah, go check. I've, I've really been enjoying reading that stuff. We've we've talked about it a bit on the Frame Rate show I do, which is about cord cutting, and, and it's been some really excellent articles, so pass that along to your coworkers. Thank you. Appreciate that. You can find us uh, on our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. That's a place where you can uh, submit stories and vote them up or down. And you can also find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv, or give us a call. Leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. Our last show of the week because of the Thanksgiving holidays is tomorrow. And Jeff Kanata joins us, plus Sarah will be back on Skype. We'll see you then.